Hey, BookTube, welcome back to the History Shelf. My name is Peg. Happy Labor Day weekend, everybody out there in the U.S., at least. Uh, we have a three-day weekend. And there's a puppy. I've had a couple people ask, where are the puppies lately? They are getting ready to launch at each other. <laughs> it's that time of day. They are ready to play, and I am ready to show you some books that I recently purchased. Um, <laughs> I went shopping. <laughs> Big surprise, right? Um, yeah, as you do. I'm not. I'm not one of these people that does the uh, read what you own thing. <laughs> I mean, I. Uh, I just love. I just love finding new books. Uh, what can I say? Um, uh, but yeah, just need to slow down the intake a little bit you know what i'm saying oh guys stop making so much noise boy they look at them look at them go ladies and gentlemen and she's heading in for a left hook no i don't know i feel like i'm, I'm doing a play-by-play -play here okay thanks for joining me here on this saturday evening um but by the time i upload this who knows it could be tomorrow sunday so Anyway, guys, yeah, so I've done a lot of book shopping lately, um, and they have accrued. So th these are from over the past few months, but I just thought I would show you them. They are a mix of historical fiction and history, so, uh, and biography. So uh, we have all of the things that the history people out there love. Um, we're going to start with this novel because I bought this one the longest ago, and I, uh, or the, yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, but I saw another booktuber who doesn't have a channel anymore, or doesn't upload videos, but he mentioned this book, and at first I was just thrilled by the size of it, because, you know, I love really huge novels, and this one is um, almost 1,300 pages, but it sounds like the kind of novel I would love to read, and in fact it is, I think it's assigned reading for, um, Oh, one of the military academies or something. Uh, no, selected to the U.S. Army Chief of Staff's professional reading list. So what am I talking about? Get ready for this. This is a trade paperback, but you're going to be astounded at how big the spine is. Ready? Okay. This is Once an Eagle by Anton Meyer. I bought this one at Barnes & Noble because I'm a premium member. They had a sale and I got like three times my stamps or something, but get ready for the spine. You ready? Wow, look at that. Look at that, guys. Once an Eagle by Anton Meyer. <clears throat> this one has a new foreword by Carlo Des De Este, who uh, wrote a, a, a very um, well-received biography on General Patton years ago. Um, this is a Harper Perennial Modern Classics, so uh, it's, a really, it's a really nice book. It just lays flat. It's easy to... It's not too heavy, even though the size of it. All right, let me tell you a little bit about this book. Okay, here we go. Required reading for West Point and Marine Corps cadets. Once an Eagle is the story of one special man, a soldier named Sam Damon, and his adversary over a lifetime, fellow officer Courtney Massengale. Damon is a professional who puts duty, honor, and the many commands above self-interest. Massengale, however, brilliantly advances by making the right connections behind the lines and in Washington's corridors of power. Beginning in the French countryside during the Great War, the conflict between these adversaries solidifies in the isolated garrison life marking peacetime, intensifies in the deadly Pacific jungles of World War II, and reaches its treacherous, I don't know why, re reaches its treacherous conclusion in the last major battleground of the Cold War, Vietnam. Now reissued with a new foreword by acclaimed historian, Carlo Dest, here is an unforgettable story of a man who embodies the best in our nation and in us all. Now Anton Meyer, um, he, was, he attended Harvard. He w enlisted in the Marine Corps immediately after Pearl Harbor, and he served for three years during World War II until he was wounded in the Pacific. So, and there's our author on the back there. I had never heard of Anton Meyer um, but I did, when I was looking up this book, I saw that I think like a mini series was made and it has my, one of my favorite, um, handsome mans back in the day, Sam Elliott, I guess, plays Sam Damon, I think, I think, 
but he's in it. He features prominently. I, I don't even know if you can find that, um, um, the whole movie on like YouTube or something. It's, it's like, I think the production value, I don't, I, I don't think it was filmed well because I, the little clips I've seen it, it's like an old, old film, but anyway, once an Eagle by Anton Meyer. So this will make a nice addition to my, um, typical kind of, you know, uh, military history or military fiction reading. Uh, but I love the fact that it kind of starts off with the Great War and it carries all the way through to Vietnam. So this is going to be a really engrossing novel. That might be a book that I would, I might want to, well, because it's so long and it's, it's hard to kind of read long books with other people because, you know, things happen and life gets in the way sometimes and you just can't keep up on things. But that could be a fun buddy read, maybe. Um... And then, because I have been itching to read this author again, I, I think, I thought I bought more of these. I kind of went a little crazy when I, just, when I um, learned that Target, I can like order books online at Target, because I've, I've, you know, I've got a red card and all that kind of stuff, um, get 5% back, I get free shipping. Um, of course, these books are not in store, but you can, you can buy almost any book you want on Target, you just have to type it in. It's crazy. And then when they have deals on books, like buy two, get one 50% off, or buy two, get one free, um, it, it all applies to any kind of book you're typing in or looking for. But I wanted to get back to James Michener. I haven't read him since I was a youngster. Um, I picked up two, but I thought I had picked up another one that I really wanted to read, which was uh, Chesapeake. And I know Bill Rutenberg, he had a, a vote going on between whether he should read Texas or Chesapeake. And I meant to tell you, Bill, Go for Chesapeake, because <laughs> I could have sworn I had ordered Chesapeake. That might be downstairs. Um, but in any event, the two I'm going to show you are, are neither Texas nor Chesapeake. Uh, but these are ordered through Target. So I heard another booktuber really rave about this one. So I picked up these beautiful new reissues from uh, the Dial Press. Um, this is James A. Michener's Alaska. Let's see if you can get that in frame there. Yeah, these dial press ones are really cool looking. Um, again, very easy to read, lays flat. Uh, in this sweeping epic of the northernmost American frontier, Michener guides us through Alaska's fierce terrain and history, from the long forgotten past to the bustling present. As his characters struggle for survival, Michener weaves together the exciting high points of Alaska's story, its brutal origins, the American acquisition, the gold rush, the tremendous growth and exploitation of the salmon industry, the arduous construction of the Alcan Highway, undertaken to defend the territory during World War II. Everyone is watching them play. And I, you know, I don't blame you. Just, you can watch them while I read to you. Uh, a spellbinding portrait of a human community fighting to establish its place in the world, Alaska traces a bold and a majestic saga of the enduring spirit of a land and its people. So, I picked up Alaska. And I also picked up this other one from Target, and this one I thought sounded intriguing. Now, I don't know. Some of the reviews looked pretty decent, but um, again, all these books, like the type on this book is, is kind of small, but this book is over a thousand pages. This is what Michener does, right? He's good at that. Um, standoff. Uh, yeah, this one's well over 1,100 pages. Um, so I picked up the source. Interesting, too, that all these new dial ones have introductions by Steve Barry, who I believe is like writes uh, kind of fanciful thrillers, adventure thrillers, I think. Um, but this one takes us to the Holy Land, baby. You know, I like that. Um, and his, is this the same opening? Okay. In his signature style of grand storytelling, James Michener transports us back thousands of years to the Holy Land through the discoveries of modern archaeolo archaeologists excavating the site of Tel Mekor, Michener vividly recreates life in an ancient city and traces the profound history of the Jewish people, from the persecution of the early Hebrews, the rise of Christianity, and the Crusades, to the founding of Israel and the modern conflict in the Middle East. An epic tale of love, strength, and faith, the source is a richly written saga, that encompasses the history of Western civilization and the great religious and cultural ideas that have shaped our world. So let's see when this book was written. 
lots of a lot of things have changed since he's written this book in the Middle East. Uh, let's see here. Um, looks like 1965, and then the copyright was renewed in 1993 with Random House. So I don't know. I mean, yeah. This this version says uh, well. This one is in its twenty fourth printing. But anyway, I've got a couple of really uh, hardy Michener reads. I still want to get Chesapeake because it kind of goes through the whole you know the early founding in the Northeast, the the colonial life. Um, I think it goes through American Revolution and stuff. So I love that stuff. So I want to get Chesapeake. I need to check to see what Bill decided to read. If you decided to read Texas, Bill, that's fine. That's totally fine. But uh, if you're still wondering, I'm kind of interested in Chesapeake. So I'll, just, I'll just put that out there. Um, the next book is a, um, a writer. This is uh, a, the, the, they're growling. This is a, a writer from the UK. And this is from a UK publisher. But I was able to source this book on Target. And uh, he's written a series of books that are all apparently standalone World War II historical fiction thrillers. Um, adventure, survival. And I love the fact that someone can write a ton of books and they, they don't have to be related or have the same character. They're just original storylines that he comes up with. And this is Graham Hurley. And so this book I picked up, I think from, I also found it on Target. Yeah, The Blood of Others. Um, and this is Head of Zeus Publishing. So this is a UK publisher but I was able to, to get this through Target I, I'm pretty sure um, yes so this book covers oh and I just oh, yes I just read about this in uh, the D-Day book in fact if you haven't watched our book chat I'm going to do a little plug <laughs> um, myself Bill Rutenberg um, and Brian MR we had a hour and 45 minute fantastic book discussion of D-Day the, the um the Climactic Battle of World War II by Stephen E. Ambrose. It's on my channel. Uh, we live streamed it on StreamYard, and um, we had some, some some people show up and add some comments and questions. Um, but we just had a, a great time just talking about just D-Day and that book. And um, towards the end of that book, they mentioned Dieppe. Deep. I don't know how to pronounce it. The you know the raid. Anyway, so Dieppe, Dieppe, August 1942. Oh, and by the way, that. I'll link below in case you don't want to go look for it. What the hell is happening over here in the background? Okay, you know what? They have taken over my show. <laughs> Pause one minute. Well, okay, now that was fun. Okay, so Dieppe, August 1942. They go a little crazy sometimes. Plans are underway for the boldest raid yet on Nazi-occupied France. Over 6,000 men. Oh, this is this had nothing to do with it. Oh, sorry. Obviously, Dieppe didn't have anything to do. I think I was reading about someone in D-Day, um, and it referenced their experience at Dieppe. Okay, sorry about that. Plans are underway for the boldest raid yet on Nazi-occupied France. Over 6,000 men will storm ashore to take the port of Dieppe. Lives will change in an instant, both on the beaches and in distant capitals. Annie Wren, working at Lord Mountbatten's Cloak and Dagger Combined Operations Headquarters, is privy to the top-secret plans for the daring cross-channel raid. Young Canadian journalist George Hogan, protege of Lord Beaverbrook, faces a crucial assignment that will test him to breaking point. And Abwehr intelligence officer Wilhelm Schultz is baiting a trap to lure thousands of Allied troops to their deaths. Three lives linked by Operation Jubilee, the Dieppe raid, 19 August 1942, over 6,000 men will storm the heavily defended French beaches. Less than half of them will make it back alive. So, um, I wanted to check this out also because um, there's a new book coming out by Graham Hurley um, that I am going to be reviewing for a historical novels review uh, for, I think, the February 2025 issue. Um, I've, I've got the PDF of it. They're going to send me a galley of it, but it's called Dead Ground. Um, but he's written a ton of others, and I'm very intrigued. And I want to, I want to, I want to read this one to get a sense of him before I read Dead Ground and then review it. Um, but I might check out his other books as well. So if you've read Graham Hurley, a lot of you guys over and gals over in the UK, please let me know um, what you think of Graham Hurley. I'm excited to to try this writer out. 
Um, oh, and then, okay, let me switch from fiction real quick and do something. Um, nope, this is not. <laughs> Got more fiction here than I thought. All right. Uh, let's mix it up with a little nonfiction now. Just to keep everyone interested, get everyone what they, what they need kind of mixed in. We'll come back to fiction in a second. I've been meaning to get this copy. Um, another Harper Perennial Modern Classics. Uh, it was super cheap. This one I got on Amazon. This is The Prophets by Abraham Heschel. And uh, I just wanted to have a just a one shot, one stop shop book on uh, on the prophets. And uh, yeah, it would go from like Hosea to Isaiah, Jeremiah. Um, uh, then he goes into different kinds of chapters on religion of sympathy. Um, comparisons and contrasts, justice, all that kind of stuff. So uh, I wanted to get this and it was like super cheap. So it says here, uh, Abraham Heschel is a seminal name in religious studies and, the, and in, the author of Man is Not Alone and God in Search of Man. When The Prophets was first published in 1962, it was immediately recognized as a masterpiece of biblical scholarship. The Prophets provides a unique opportunity for readers of the Old Testament, both Christian and Jewish, to gain fresh and deep knowledge of Israel's prophetic movement. The author's profound understanding of the Prophets also opens the door to new insight into the philosophy of religion. So I picked this one up. Just wanted to, just wanted to have it. I don't know when I'm going to start it, but I've been meaning to. And then I kind of, you know, then we're going into the more of the realm of Science, philosophy, the theosophy, uh, epis no, not epistemology. Well, what, 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 what do we got here? Yeah, theism, cosmology. Anyway, um, I'm intrigued. I've seen this guy's. I haven't read his other book. I have it, but I, you know what? I don't have a mind. I'm just being very honest. Some of the concepts of like hard science and stuff. I just, I physics, since I just. That's why I'm a history person, everybody. But I thought, let me challenge my brain a little bit. Let me see how far I can get into this before I just decide to throw it across the room or something. I don't know. Um, but I've seen him on different podcasts, and I've enjoyed listening to him. This is uh, Return of the God Hypothesis by Stephen C. Meyer, with the subtitle of Three Scientific Discoveries That Reveal the Mind Behind the Universe. Um, yeah. So let me see here. Beginning in the late 19th century, many, many intellectuals began to insist that scientific knowledge conflicts with traditional theistic belief, that science and belief in God are, quote, at war, end quote. Philosopher of science and director of the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute, Stephen C. Meyer, challenges this view by examining three scientific discoveries with decidedly theistic implications. Building on the case for the intelligent design of life that he developed in Signature in the Cell and Darwin's Doubt, Meyer demonstrates how discoveries in cosmology and physics, coupled with those in biology, help to establish the identity of the designing intelligence behind life and the universe. Uh, Meyer argues that theism, with its affirmation of a transcendent, intelligent, and active creator, best explains the evidence we have concerning biological and cosmological, cosmological origins. Previously, Meyer refrained from attempting to answer questions about who might have designed life. Now he provides an evidence-based answer revealing a stunning conclusion. The data support not just the existence of an intelligent designer of some kind, but the existence of a personal God. So that's, that's, that's going to be quite the... Uh, if he can prove that. See, this is stuff where you're going to lose me. <laughs> Oh, the DNA sequencing and uh, no, I don't know, whatever that is. I, but, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it the old college try. Oh, my Lord. This is what I'm talking about, though. Um, Nucleon crevasse. Ooh, wow. Um, I thought, you know, and it, oh, it was on, uh, yeah, it was on sale. So I thought, <laughs> why not? Um, but sometimes, you know, I do want to, I want to understand these things more, but Oh, the red, I do know what a redshift is. I do remember that from my, my uh, astronomy class, the redshift. Okay, so I picked that one up. 
that so that is definitely a nonfiction book. Then a couple of you viewers out there told me I should I read another book by this gentleman, a recent book by him, and someone said you've got to read this book because it was amazing. Plus it was a National Book Award winner. So I finally got around to picking up The Worst Hard Time by Timothy Egan. The untold story of those who survived the great American Dust Bowl. Let's see if I can get that glare off of there. There we go. Um, yeah, I just picked this up off of off uh, Amazon. And but I, what was that recent book that he wrote? He book that he wrote that I reviewed, and I'm trying to remember. But anyway, let me read this to you. The dust storms that terrorized America's high plains in the darkest years of the Depression were like nothing ever seen before. In this book, Pulitzer Prize-winning New York Times journalist and author Timothy Egan tells the epic story of this environmental disaster and its impact on the communities stricken with fear and choked by dust in the dirty 30s. That's in quotes. The dirty 30s. Um, John Steinbeck gave voice to those who fled the Dust Bowl in his masterpiece, The Grapes of Wrath. This is the story of those who stayed and survived, those who now in their 80s and 90s will soon carry their memories to the grave. And it is an extraordinary story of endurance and heroism in an era that promises ever greater natural disasters. The Worst Hard Time is a powerful cautionary tale about the dangers of trifling with nature. So yes, I definitely want to uh, check this out. Well, it's a picture from Southern Colorado. Black Sunday, not coming in really well, but, um, yeah, it's just, it was, it's been a book on my TBR, like I've been wanting to check it out, and then someone else recommended it, so thank you for that, uh, and then I picked this one up when it was on sale, um, as well, this is from Farrar, Strauss, and Drew, and this is a biography on Milton Freedom, Freedom, <laughs> Milton Friedman, The Last Conservative, by Jennifer Burns. Uh, I definitely want to add that to my uh, my shelf of um, conservative thinking uh, thinkers, writers. It's on this shelf right here, uh, a little bit here, and a little bit over there. But yeah, this is a lot of like political thought on that shelf. Um, yeah, I've got Milton Freedom. I keep I want to call the man Freedom. Maybe I'll just call him. Maybe he'd like that. Milton Freedom, Friedman. Uh, I have his book, the, um, oh, you know, the one that's very, I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, this, let's see here, Milton Friedman was, alongside John Maynard Keynes, the most influential economist of the 20th century. His work was instrumental in the turn toward free markets that defined the 80s, and his full-throated defenses of capitalism and freedom, there's that, that word, freedom, resonated with audiences around the world. It's no wonder that the last decades of the 20th century have been called the age of Friedman, or that an analysts have sought both to credit him for the rising prosperity of recent times and to hold him responsible for the era's social ills. Jennifer Burns has written the first full biography of Friedman to use archival sources, and in it she tells his extraordinary story with the nuance it deserves. Um... She provides lucid and lively context for his groundbreaking work on everything from why dentists earn less than doctors to the causes of the Great Depression to the vital importance of the money supply to inflation and the limits of government planning and stimulus. Milton Friedman, the last conservative, also traces his long-standing collaborations with women, including the economist Anna Schwartz, his complex relationships with powerful figures such as the Federal Reserve Chairman Arthur Burns and the Treasury Secretary George Shultz, and his direct interventions in policymaking at the highest levels. Most of all, Burns explores Friedman's key role in creating a new economic vision and a modern American conservatism. The result is a revelatory biography of an architect of our times. So yeah, this one I had to have, um, and it will be going up on that shelf. You'll soon see this light mint green cover very very subtle i liked how they just chose that color the color of money baby i'm uh, just, just kidding i don't have a love of money it's the root of all evil that's what i'm saying um i get to credit i don't know if i've shown i don't think i've shown this yet on this channel but i get to credit vin at revenant reads 
because he, he flashed this book on his channel last year sometime and I said oh my god I've got to get this book <laughs> this is beautiful this is a beautiful volume I don't I've never seen this publisher before Kodansha this is Musashi by I.G. Yoshikawa this is the classic right the samurai classic by Kodansha USA is the publisher <sighs> the best-selling samurai epic I, th I think I just ordered this one off of Amazon. Um, let's see here. It's kind of uh, it's a, the uh, the type is very very small, very very small, but um, and the book itself is almost a thousand pages. This is says here the classic samurai novel about the real exploits of the most famous swordsman. Miyamoto Musashi was the child of an era when Japan was emerging from decades of civil strife. Uh, lured to the great battle of Sekigahara in 1600 by the hope of becoming a samurai, without really knowing what it meant, he regains consciousness after the battle to find himself lying defeated, dazed and wounded among thousands of the dead and dying. On his way home, he commits a rash act, becomes a fugitive and brings life in his own village to a standstill until he is captured by a weaponless Zen monk. The lovely Otsu, seeing in Musashi her ideal of manliness, frees him from his tortuous, tortuous punishment, but he is recaptured and imprisoned. During three years of solitary confinement, he delves into the classics of Japan and China. When he is set free again, he rejects the position of samurai and for the next several years pursues his goal relentlessly, looking neither to left nor to right. Ever so slowly, it dawns on him that following the way of the sword is not simply a matter of finding a target for his brute strength. Continually striving to perfect his technique, which leads him to a unique style of fighting with two swords simultaneously, he travels far and wide, challenging fighters of many disciplines, taking nature to be his ultimate and severest teacher and undergoing the rigorous training of those who follow the way. He is supremely successful in his encounters, but in the art of war, he perceives the way of peaceful and prosperous governance and disciplines himself to be a real human being. Wow, this is giving me the whole life story. Uh, I'm going to stop there. But it says that this is a novel in the best tradition of Japanese storytelling. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it sounds really great. So I finally got Musashi. Wow. Okay, I know this is kind of a grab bag, but you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, that I picked up along the way. Um, I've been wanting to read more books from the same author, especially if they're a part of a series. And uh, some of these are really like slim little like swashbuckling novels that, I don't know, I had a, a yen for. Uh, and I wanted to try reading this new author, J.H. Galerter. And these are from W.W. Norton. I keep forgetting which book is which. I don't think I have the first book in the series, but I've got books two and three now, and I'm going to try to get the first one. Uh, so J.H. Galunter has written like a swashbuckling, like sailing, um, like nautical series. This one came out in 2023. I don't know which one is first. Let's go with this one. Captain Gray's Gambit. Um, Okay, I think Hold Fast is the first book in the series. So it's a, a, a Thomas Gray novel, is what it's called. I'm trying to for, I'm trying to see which one. So then the other one I picked up is the Mont Video Brief. Okay, so let me just check to see <laughs> which is which. I don't want to read the description so much as just kind of give you an overall. Okay, yeah, this one is the second novel in the series. The second novel in, in Glurnter's lauded Thomas Gray series, Captain Gray's Gambit, continues a story that is smart, fast, twisty, and dangerous, says Lee Child, um, in a richly imagined early 19th century world. So it's in the age of Napoleon um, and uh, is it Nelson. Uh, yeah. Who's, okay, so... Um, Okay, it's the second novel, so I need to get hold fast, is what I'm saying. Uh, but I, they were, either I picked this one up on um, a book outlet haul or a, um, 
Hamilton book, but I haven't done my massive Hamilton book haul, but I'm thinking of doing it Sunday or Monday because it's Labor Day and why not have a Labor Day Bonanza book haul, like a big book haul from Hamilton book. But anyway, this is one of the ones I picked up. And then this is the latest one that I'm aware of, the Mont Video Brief. As you can see, they're, they're very slim little reads, but you know, I like stuff like that. Just a little palate cleanser and then I move on. Um, okay, so these two are novels by the same author, but I read one of these when I was really young and didn't understand it. I just thought the cover of the book was really cool. Of course, the cover of the book now is way different. The cover of the book that I had back in the early 90s um, had like a, a picture of the philosopher on the, the page, but I wanted to reread it because it's been so long. So this is by the author, this is the author, <laughs> the author is Irvin D. Yalom, and this is When Nietzsche Wept. This is a, a newer, um, this is a, what did you call this, a Harper Perennial? Got a lot of Harper Perennial modern classics floating around um, When Nietzsche Wept. I do want to revisit this. It's been ages. In 19th century Vienna, the drama of love, fate, and will is played out amid the intellectual ferment that defined the era. Joseph Brewer, one of the founding fathers of psychoanalysis, is at the height of his career. Friedrich Nietzsche, Europe's greatest philosopher, is on the brink of suicidal despair, unable to find a cure for the headaches and other ailments that plague him. When he agrees to treat Nietzsche, with his experimental talking cure, Brewer, Brewer never expects that he too will find solace in their sessions. Only through facing his own inner demons can the gifted healer begin to help his patient. In When Nietzsche Wept, Irvin D. Yalom blends fact and fiction. I, I like that. Atmosphere and suspense to unfold an unforgettable story about the redemptive power of friendship. Um, and there's our author on the back. So, yeah, I, I have some faint memories of reading it but I, I need to reread it so when I was looking this book up then I saw another really nice looking volume by Irvin D. Yalom that also sounded really interesting and I have not read this one it's another Harper Perennial Classics and this is The Schopenhauer Cure by Irvin D. Yalom okay um, I think I just got these off of Amazon. Suddenly confronted with his own mortality after a routine checkup, eminent psychotherapist Julius Hertzfeld is forced to re-examine his life and work and seeks out Philip Slate, a sex addict whom he failed to help some 20 years earlier. Yet Philip claims to be cured, miraculously transformed by the pessimistic teachings of German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer and is himself a philosophical counselor in training. Philip's dour, misanthropic, misanthropic stance compels Julius to invite Philip to join his intensive therapy group, oh no, in exchange for tutoring on Schopenhauer. But with mere months left, life may be far too short to help Philip or to complete or to compete with him for the hearts and minds of the group members. And then again, it might be just long enough. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is interesting. And the author himself is a psychotherapist. So it, it all kind of, both these books make sense that he's, you know, kind of indulging in, in that um okay last three books and these are nonfiction. Uh, i i want to have a shout out i don't know if you're gonna watch this or not but faith at faith and books thank you for this recommendation uh I, I it looked familiar but i don't think i ever finally you know pulled the pulled the trigger on it you know to to order it but i finally did in um in our group discussion we are i'm part of a group um along with faith at faith and books uh, Christy, Christy Lewis at Dostoevsky in Space, um, and Tony, Tony Paul Cross, and Courtney Reeds, and I, is there anyone else? Sorry, we're doing Red September, where we're reading about uh, communism or the Soviet Union, all things, and she's kind of focusing on like dissidents or memoirs and stuff like that, and she mentioned this book, and I was like, I have to get it, and so I did, I ordered it, and uh, thanks, Faith. So now I got a copy. It's With God in Russia, the inspiring classic account of the Catholic priests, 23 years in Soviet prisons and labor camps by Walter, uh, Walter J. Sizek. He's a Jesuit, and that's what SJ means, Society uh, of Jesus, uh, with Daniel L. Flaherty. Um, 
Yep, he was an American Jesuit missionary priest who spent 23 years in the Soviet Union before and during the Cold War. So this is the classic memoir by uh, Walter Sezek, who survived 15 years of imprisonment in the Soviet Union. Uh, powerful and inspirational, this book captures the heroic patience, endurance, and religious conviction of a man whose life embodied the Christian ideals that sustained him. Um, if you're new to the channel, theology and Christian uh, studies are also um, something I feature on. I feature on this channel um, frequently, and I do like to read these things. Um, so yay! And the yeah, the theology and everything else. I'm just really into it. Um, so with God in Russia, uh, I'm looking forward to checking this one out as well. And then these, um, I had already seen one of these in a galley, and I just decided I wanted to. Uh, uh, pick this up there. You had a book sale. I forget what the the, the event was, but everything just hardcover was way way marked down. So, or did I get this as a finished copy from the publisher? You know, now I can't remember. But we're gonna show it anyway. I have a, I have the final copy of Victor Davis Hanson's The End of Everything: How Wars Descend into the Annihilation. I, I know I've shown the galley on the channel, but I I just didn't get the final copy. So, um. Yeah, end of everything is, uh, you know, Victor Davis Hanson. He's a he's a great military historian. I, you know, I don't go to him for his political opinions. I go to him for uh, his knowledge of ancient history, um, and uh, like especially ancient military history like that. That's what I go to him for, um, and just analyzing you know war and civilization. Uh, and so what this book does, um, he narrates a series of sieges and sackings that span the age of antiquity to the conquest of the new world to show how societies descend into barbarism and obliteration. In the stories of Thebes, Carthage, Constantinople, and Tenochtitlan, he depicts wars, drama, violence, and folly. <laughs> Tenochtitlan, I don't know how to pronounce Tenochtitlan. Whew. Highlighting the, na the naivete that plagued the vanquished and the wrath that justified mass slaughter, Hansen delivers a sobering call to contemporary readers to heed the lessons of obliteration, lest we blunder into catastrophe once again. So, happy to have the finished copy. And then this book was also marked down, and I just decided to get it. It is a uh, collaboration between Andrew Roberts, whom I really enjoy, uh, and General David Petraeus, who uh, obviously I, I have, well, I don't, I haven't read much by him. I, I know who he is, and I'm aware, oh, this book kind of got a little banged up on the bottom. But that's okay. Um, but I wanted to check this out because I am a military history geek. I love military history. Um, wow, look at that. This is the Soviet Union's first nuclear test at Semipalatinsk. Palatinsk, August 29th, 1949. That's kind of poof. That's startling. Um, anyway, this is, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is conflict, uh, the evolution of warfare from 1945 to Ukraine by General David Petraeus and Andrew Roberts. This is uh, another Harper book. So, all right, and this is my last one, guys. Um, I won't read it too long. I'll, I'll just read this uh, blurb. Two leading authorities, the outstanding battlefield commander and strategist of our time. Strategist of our time? Okay, I guess so. I guess, yeah, I guess in that sense. And a strategist of our time and an acclaimed historian and biographer, cl biographer collaborates on a landmark examination of war since 1945. Conflict is both a sweeping history of the evolution of warfare up to Putin's invasion of Ukraine and a penetrating analysis of what we must learn from the past in order to navigate and in the future anticipate an increasingly perilous world. So I just thought this would be a very timely read and I'd like to get this read by the end of this year before another war starts. <laughs> okay, so there's conflict. Uh, in the, so that kind of just rounds up some of my, ooh, some of my recent my recent acquisitions. Uh, let me know what you think. What do you think, guys? It's a, there's quite a lot here. Oh my gosh, and some of these are heavy. Musashi is heavy. It's a really nice book. It's very sturdy. It's, you, you're paying for some really good binding on that book. Um, 
really excited for the blood of others. Um, I want to try to read this before I have to start reading uh, his latest book coming out for review. And uh, yeah, then I've got some just massive, some more massive, civil, you know, historical fiction stuff along with uh, a memoir um, with God in Russia. So that that'll supplement my Red September reading. Um, I can't believe tomorrow is September. Today's the last day of August. Wow. And then I've got a bunch of these guys right here. Ooh. So, so what do you got, BookTube? <laughs> I showed you, I showed you mine. You show me yours. Um, yeah, so let me go ahead and upload this, and uh, I'll try to get back to you guys. Uh, I might try to do another video over this three-day weekend. Um, got a lot of reading to do, obviously, um, still, and always, but I enjoy it. But I do want to make some more videos for all of you, because I got lots of stuff to talk about. Um, lots of things happening at the History Shelf. The History Shelf is taking off. I don't know what's going on, but um, I don't know. I think people are aware of me now. I mean, I'm still a small channel, but um, I'm getting a lot of books in the mail from publicists and um, a lot of authors are wanting to do interviews and I am thrilled by that. I am just thrilled. So uh, we'll have more author interviews coming. I'd like to do some more book chats uh, with all my other booktube friends and have those up for you guys. So yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, I'm really excited about where the channel's going and I, I wanna offer more variety outside of book hauls and stuff as far as author interviews and book chats um, even single videos where I just kind of talk about a book I've read recently. In fact, I've got another project coming up. I'm very excited to announce soon. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't want to give it away just yet. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be undertaking a reading of a very long uh, historical fiction mystery series. And I'm very excited to announce that. Um, so that's coming very soon. I hope to put something together on that next week. Um, I was going to show you a couple more books I had bought, but I'm going to save those for a Halloween themed video. Uh, I really want to read some, some horror novels. What can I say? Um, history and horror. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've got, um, I've got a few horror novels that I, I want to dip into. And then I have a history book on the history of horror. So how perfect is that? For this channel, the history of horror. Um, so there's a lot going on at the history shelf. I just want you to know I'm always working on something here. I'm always kicking it. Look at that. There's that, that red light. I am working on this channel like you don't even know. Um, so stay, stick with me. Hit the notification button. Um, if you if you have a friend in your life that loves history, just let them know about my channel. I'd, I'd love it. Um, yeah. But until next time, guys, I hope you're enjoying your weekend. Stay safe out there. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.